You've probably had the experience of some, sometimes that a piece of scripture was just meant for you to hear at that time in your life. And that's so helpful because there is so much in the scripture that reflects what's going on in our own lives. Now the second reading we had, which comes from an epistle of Peter to the Universal Church, struck me as a kind of template for what I had experienced this past week. I was asked to go to another parish to do a funeral for a family I'd known for uh, over 30 years. And I wondered what I was going to find because the mother of the family was a widow. Her husband had died relatively recently and at too young an age to die. Then her son-in-law, her daughter's husband, was killed by a falling tree. And I was there because another, a son, only 44 years old, who had struggled with cancer as a child and had more or less defeated it, but also it weakened his body, so he had two weeks of slow and painful death. It's a horrible series of things to happen to one family. And as I, as I went there, I said, where are they going to be? Are they going to be angry with God? Are they going to be filled with doubt? No. No, they weren't. They were filled with faith and love of the brother for whom we had this service. Sometimes things happen in life that are just terrible, and then something else, and then something else. And we wonder, has God forgotten us? Does God care? Does, is God good? And Peter wrote to the early Christians in that second reading, you'll have to suffer through various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, even though tested by fire, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor of God. Well, this was a real trial for that family. So filled with tears, his brothers who came to talk, stood up to talk about their brother who they were burying, just filled with tears. They, they stopped talking for a while. It was beautiful. And that's right there in Peter's epistle, suffering through various trials in this life by which the genuineness of our faith is demonstrated and enters more deeply within us. And then it also says here that through the great mercy, God gave us a new birth, an inheritance that is imperishable. And so they were relying on the mercy of God so that their brother, their son, would know the reward of a good life. I remembered him, so, such a gentle boy, when he was undergoing chemotherapy at the National Cancer Institute, and I was sitting there by his bed, looking so innocent. He passed away, but it did not destroy the faith of his family, even all that accumulated grief. They did not doubt in the darkness what they had learned in the light. And that is a beautiful thing to be able to say, to know in our hearts. So, in this gospel passage, we find Thomas. How is he enduring his trials? Well, he was an organized, detailed, analytical kind of person. So that's how he comes across. I'm not going to believe. Are you kidding? 
rising from the dead, that's not credible. I'll have to touch Jesus myself, put my fingers into, into his side. And Jesus did not get angry, did not criticize him. Jesus realized that doubt is often part of faith. I'd be, I'd be very suspicious of, of an adult who came to me and said, I've never had any doubts about my faith. How can that be in this very secular environment in which we live? Doubts are normal in people's life. But as Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, who used to preach here, once said, a thousand doubts do not add up to one denial. Something for us to remember as we have the courage to ask questions and reflect deeply on the mystery of life. A thousand doubts do not add up to one denial. And so we have Thomas who touches Jesus and he doesn't say my Lord, my rabbi, my teacher, my Messiah. He says, my Lord and my God. It is the clearest statement of the divinity of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And oftentimes people who wrestle with doubt have profound convictions. Their faith is more strong than they even realize in their consciousness. So Thomas, at that moment, truly began his life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's what we are called to be. It's not about having the right feelings. It's not about even being devotional. It is about doing what God asks us to do and believing in his son. It is a way of living, a way of seeing reality. And Thomas is opened up to that. And it makes all the difference in his life as he went out preaching apparently to India gave up his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Mother Teresa of Calcutta wrote this, even when all goes wrong and I feel as if I'm a ship without a compass, I must give myself completely to him. It is oftentimes in the darkness that our deepest, most heroic faith takes shape, takes shape, shape and becomes part of who we are. When things are going well, it doesn't require a lot of depth to live our lives. When things are falling apart, when we're not being treated fairly, when we have too many bad things happening in our life, that is when the spirit of the living God helps us to create a faith that is imperishable, becomes part of who we are. And we take the word of Jesus Christ as the wisdom by which we live our lives. And that's what Easter is all about. That each one of us has an eternal destiny and we are called to walk the path of our life in companionship with Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen.